Good evening, and welcome to the annual lecture in the McKenna Center's Distinguished Speaker Series. My name is Dr. Kim Fenwick, and I'm the Vice President Academic and Research here at St. Thomas University. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Willistiqui, whose ancestors, along with the Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy nations, signed peace and friendship treaties with the British Crown in the 1700s. St. Thomas University established the McKenna Center seven years ago to explore how information and technology was affecting communications and public policy. We had recognized that the way in which governments, institutions, and corporations interact with each other and with the public was undergoing significant change. The manner in which public policy was being developed and implemented was evolving. A one-way system that simply informed the public was becoming a two-way dynamic process that engages the public, stakeholders, advocacy groups, corporations, and citizens groups. As an institution of higher learning, St. Thomas wanted to explore that dynamic. We especially wanted to educate our students to excel in communications for whatever causes motivate and inspire them. As Premier of New Brunswick and Canada's Ambassador to the United States, Frank McKenna understood the role of public policy. He understood the ability, that the ability to communicate effectively could bring people together. He also understood the importance of communicating regardless of political perspective. The range of speakers that we have hosted in the McKenna Center Distinguished Speaker Series has shown that, diver that diversity of perspective. Our students have heard from law professor Michael Geist, education expert Margaret McCain, climate change adaptation expert Blair Feltmate, the leader of the Federal Green Party, Elizabeth May, Senator Michael Kirby, Prime Minister Paul Martin, and tonight the president of the ITK, Natan Obed. I'm now pleased to call on Dr. Jamie Gillies, coordinator of the Communications and Public Policy Program and Executive Director of the Frank McKenna Center for Communications and Public Policy to introduce our guest speaker. While he's on sabbatical this year, Dr. Gillies has found time to be one of the region's leader, leading political commentators on the federal election. In effect, he is helping to explain the differences in public policy and communications among the political parties competing for your support. And he has also found time to help organize this lecture. Dr. Gillies. Thank you for coming out. Um, uh, as, Kim, as Dr. Fenwick mentioned, I'm, I'm Jamie Gillies. I'm an associate professor here at St. Thomas and uh, the executive director of the McKenna Center for Communications and Public Policy. Uh, welcome to this distinguished lecture entitled Advancing Inuit Self-Determination Admits Growing International Interest and Activity in Our Homeland. Um, as Vice Fre President Fenwick mentioned, the McKenna Center was established uh, in 2012 and is host to this annual speaker series, uh, student scholarships, faculty research grants, symposiums and policy forums, and offers students access to real life public policy activities. On occasion, the center is also able to bring notable leaders to campus to speak with our students, faculty, alumni, and community. Tonight is one of those occasions, and may I say what an honor it is to bring President Natana Obed to St. Thomas. Our speaker is president of Inuit Taparit Kanatomi, which represents the more than 60,000 Inuit people living in Canada. He has devoted his career to working with Inuit representational organizations to improve the well-being of Inuit in Canada. After graduating from Tufts University in Boston, he returned to Canada to work at ITK in Ottawa before returning to Labrador to work for the Labrador Inuit Association. For 10 years, he lived in Iqaluit, Nunavut, and worked as the Director of Social and Cultural Development for Nunavut Tungavik, the organization that represents the rights of Nunavut Inuit. As president of ITK, he is responsible for leading the national representational organization protecting and advancing the rights and interests of Inuit in Canada. It works to improve the health and well-being of Inuit, and its activities include research, advocacy, public outreach, and education. So without further ado, please welcome President Natano Obed. <laughs> 
Nakumik, uh, thank you for that warm welcome. Hunukut, everyone, good evening. As I've been introduced, my name is Natan Obed. And um, before I start, I just wanted to recognize how interesting it is for me to be here. Uh, on my birth certificate, it says I was born in Fredericton, New Brunswick. And that is undoubtedly true. I do not remember it. <laughs> but uh, it was uh, because my mother is American. She's from Maine. And my father is from Nunatsiavut. And the map you have here in front of you will be up throughout my talk. And I'll be referencing parts of it or the concept behind it throughout. But Nunatsiavut is the further most east region uh, within Inuit Nunangat. He actually was in Bible school in Nova Scotia, and uh, th we were on our way back to Labrador at the time, and my mother did not want me to be born in the United States, and so they stayed at a, a motel just outside of Fredericton waiting for me to arrive. And once I did, then they headed on back to Labrador. So it is a very uh, interesting connection that I share with Fredericton and with New Brunswick and one that I hardly ever get to tell. <laughs> so I'm glad I have a receptive audience here this evening. Really, uh, we live in extraordinary times. And uh, for, I, live, I lived through an era of time where it was not a good thing to be indigenous. It wasn't a good thing to be Inuk. You could get made fun of just because of the color of your skin. And now, in 2019, uh, First Nations, Inuit and Métis, have so much pride in, um, in our ethnicity, our indigenousness, and, and our indigenous history. And Canada is increasingly open to understanding indigenous peoples, understanding indigenous peoples' rights, and then also uh, setting aside racism and other marginalization of our people and it's happening in academia, it's happening in governments, it's happening in society across Canada, and it's wonderful to see that change. I am a product, as I said, of, of two parents with vastly different uh, backgrounds. My father was relocated at the age of five from the community that he called home, and then he was, uh, was put in or, uh, residential school at the age of eight, where he stayed until he was 18. My mother, on the other hand, grew up in Maine in the United States and was a teacher uh, for most of her adult life, but started off uh, in Labrador being, uh, working as a dorm mother in the very same residential school facility that my father was actually attending. And that's where they first had been introduced. Later on, when my mother was working at a residential school in Northwest River, Labrador, is when they started dating. So, I come from both sides. I come from um, a history of relocation and residential school and oppression. Uh, um, my father was orphaned by the time he was seven because of uh, the, the difficulty that his parents had in adjusting to living in another place after being relocated. And then on my mother's side, I come from a vastly different space where she thought that she was doing a, a good thing by teaching at a residential school. And actually during the residential school um, conversations that have happened and the truth telling that's happened, uh, my mother has been uh, really uh, broken uh, by, a lot of the converse, by a lot of the truths that, that have been shared about what happened in those schools. And she always has said to me that if she knew those things were happening in Northwest River, she would have done something. She would have fought for those children because she loved them. And, she, and it was interesting because many of uh, the uh, Inuit that went to those schools have since come and talked to me and told me that my mother was one of the only people that actually loved them in their whole childhood and that actually fought for them. So it's, so it's interesting to see the residential school experience from a more nuanced way. And it's not to say that uh, my mother was a saint and was, um, uh, was doing something that, that we shouldn't be critical of. It's just to say that in many cases, this history that we share together in this country is very complex. And that um, I, as an indigenous person, as an Inuk, have this history and can talk about it openly. And it doesn't make me any less Inuk to do so. And that's, I think, another thing uh, that is changing over time, 
is that the concepts that non-Indigenous people have about indigeneity, about who can be Indigenous, who fits within a, a community and who doesn't, that's being force, forcefully taken away from um, the state, taken away from the federal government, taken away from uh, public perception, and being rightfully put in the hands of Indigenous people, whether they be First Nations, Inuit, or Métis. So in our land claim agreement, in our modern treaty, we have provisions in that agreement about who are beneficiaries of the agreement, who are Inuit within the context of the Labrador Inuit land claim agreement. And there are members within our community who decide, and there are a number of different provisions within that agreement. But um, the point being is that identity and belonging to uh, my community is a reciprocal thing and it is one that we create. It isn't necessarily one that is judged or imposed upon us. So I'm proudly Inuk. I'm also uh, proud to, to, to be the son of, of, um, of my mother. And it's, it's, so it's an interesting thing because a lot of audiences and a lot of people across the country get, uh, get really perturbed and think that there is one box that we can put everyone in. Um, we live in a time where everyone will, or most everyone accepts that indigenous peoples have rights. It's just a, in a, you wouldn't walk down the street in any part of this country, no matter how conservative or no matter how um, uh, combative that community might be towards indigenous rights, indigenous peoples. And there, but there would be a begrudging statement that yes, indigenous peoples do have rights. This is relatively new. The reality is indigenous peoples have had rights forever. <laughs> and the existence of those rights has, has been here all along. The recognition and implementation of those rights is what we are struggling with today. So Inuit Tapri Kanatsumi and the work that we do is not creating new rights for Inuit. It is the ongoing work towards self-determination that we are pushing for through the existing rights that we have and the implementation of those existing rights through, um, through all sorts of different measures. And I'll be talking about a few of those measures tonight. I'll be also be talking a bit about uh, the global spotlight on um, our homeland. We call it Inuit Nunangat. You might call it the North or the Arctic, but this is the term that we use to, uh, to describe the entirety of our Canadian Inuit homeland. It comprises about 35% uh, of Canada's landmass, so roughly 3.3 million square kilometers. Over 50% of Canada's coastline is within this space. And within this Inuit Nunangat space, the entirety of it is co-managed between Inuit and provincial, territorial, and federal interests. We, within that space, uh, we do have uh, four modern treaties, land claim agreements that were signed in 1975 in Nunavik, uh, 1984 in the Inuvialuit region in the west, 1993 in uh, Nunavut, which also then created the territory of Nunavut, and also is the space that most Canadians associate with Inuit. Uh, and it is uh, the place where the most Inuit live, approximately 53% of Inuit uh, who live in Inuit Nunangat live in Nunavut. But that particular structure is one of four regions, not the entirety of the Inuit homeland. And then the Labrador Inuit land claim agreement was, was signed in 2005. So that we have modern treaties and, the, and we have settlement areas and then fee simple title to lands within those settlement areas. So roughly 18% of, of that 3.3 million square kilometers is held collectively, but in fee simple title uh, amongst the four Inuit regions. So we have our own geopolitical space and we are working very hard with the federal government and with all Canadians for Canada to recognize our Inuit homeland in the same way that you might recognize other geopolitical spaces, uh, whether it's 
um, uh, the G7 or whether it's a specific federal policy spaces like Atlantic region or the Quebec region or Ontario or the Western region. In many different areas of public policy, we are trying to uh, stake our place as a relevant public policy interest. And then also politically, uh, when it comes, especially when it comes to sovereignty, for the recognition of Inuit within the sovereignty space that Canada occupies and the legitimacy of sovereignty for this country in that, in, in that entire region, 35% of Canada exists squarely on the shoulders of Inuit and the, um, the way in which sovereignty can be exercised moving forward uh, has to have more focus on this reality than any other. There are vast differences between First Nations, Inuit, and Métis when it comes to the work that we do. Um, we don't fall under the Indian Act as Inuit, although uh, as per a decision in 19, a Supreme Court decision in 1939, the Re-Eskimo decision, we are Indians in relation to Section 9124 of the Constitution. Uh, how this all pl has played out over the last 75 years uh, is something that is so complex that uh, even with the 15 to 20 years of public policy experience that I have and then the four years of university beforehand where I focused very heavily on, on this area, I still get lost in it. Uh, and I think that's the point for, uh, for a colonial power sometimes is to make something so maddeningly confusing, so completely um, random, that people just live with this, these assumptions that, um, that don't help with the development of the affected group, in this case, indigenous peoples, and then do nothing to exercise and implement our, our rights. So we have piecemeal Supreme Court decisions that affect then the way in which the government of Canada and provinces and territories work with First Nations, Inuit and Métis. We have a patchwork of legislation uh, such as the Indian Act and, and other statutes that uh, affect some Indigenous peoples but not all. And then we have a largely ignorant political class that sees Indigenous as a, a homogeneous group and thinks that policy solutions that are status quo sometimes just find the indigenous people wherever they might be naturally. And that's the space uh, where we have tried to actively push back against. In, um, in federal budgets, before 2015, there was never a federal budget that specifically allocated resources to Inuit uh, within it. Uh, there, there may have all been indigenous references within the federal budget, but very often those indigenous references were linked specifically to the Indian Act and the federal responsibilities for First Nations on reserve. Without the specificity within federal budgets, then the simplicity of the public policy solutions held and Inuit were left um, without the ability to avail ourselves of many different programs that the federal government claimed to be um, delivering on behalf of indigenous peoples. And the solution, or the scenario was that uh, we aren't under the Indian Act, we have modern treaties, and we are um, citizens of each of these four jurisdictions, Newfoundland and Labrador, Quebec, Nunavut, and the Northwest Territories. Therefore, public governments are the ones that are focused mainly on providing education, healthcare, um, and housing, and any number of different social uh, programs to Inuit. In cases where there are massive gaps in outcomes, then there were specific programs that were meant to close those gaps, but often those programs were bilateral arrangements between the federal government and the jurisdictions, the public government jurisdictions in which Inuit lived. So even though there was Inuit specific money that might flow outside of budget processes for things like um, reducing the overcrowding rate uh, for our housing or 
uh, reducing the suicide rate uh, within Inuit Nunangat. The, the money always flowed through channels that excluded Inuit rights holders in decision making and participation. It was always federal governments and provinces and territories deciding uh, how Inuit money would be spent or then how as Inuits as citizens of a particular jurisdiction would be treated uh, in programs and services. Now, that policy is a massive failure. The, the outcomes uh, that we have today show that the status quo has not worked. Our overcrowding rate is, uh, I believe, 50% uh, in relation to, um, I believe, 6% for the Canadian population. Our tuberculosis rates are upwards to 300 times the rates of non-Indigenous uh, Canadians born in Canada. Uh, our educational attainment rates are about 40% of our students who graduate from grade 12. And then our median income is roughly $70,000 less, uh, between $25,000 for Inuit and $95,000 for non-Inuit who live within our homeland. These are just some of uh, the socioeconomic indicators that drive home the same point, is that money invested in public policy and for um, solutions-oriented programs and services have missed their mark or are not uh, structured in a way that they could be effective. Uh, I became president four years ago of Inuit Upbreak Anatomy before the government changed. And I, I had no idea what uh, the, the first three years of, or the, the three years of my presidency held. I was very happy to have um, the access to this past government and the ability to uh, um, do meaningful work with the Prime Minister and many members of his cabinet. And for us, the, the first thing that we wanted to leave in the minds of all ministers and the Prime Minister was the idea of the Inuit Nunangat policy space and the uh, distinctions-based approach between Indigenous peoples that could be applied in anything that the government did. Instead of focusing exclusively on a certain pot of money for a certain problem at a certain point in time, we felt it was uh, a time to be transformational in the administration of Indigenous peoples' uh, services and programs and the implementation of our rights. So things like the inclusion of federal budgets uh, was high on our list. And so over the last three federal budgets, there have been over a billion dollars that has been allocated to Inuit specific issues that then flow directly to Inuit through Inuit specific governance models. And if each one of these four regions would like to work in partnership with the public governments of their jurisdiction to implement the funds for things like housing or research or tuberculosis, they can. But the point is, is that we get to decide. And we might not have the existing capacity within our rights holding organizations at this very moment, but we uh, have the ability to gain capacity. And in our uh, slow and steady march towards self-determination, the ability to decide how funds are spent and the ability to impact decision-making within the federal government and to have the federal government recognize the primacy of Inuit rights holders instead of its public government jurisdictions when it came to investing in Inuit specific issues. That was one of the biggest wins that Inuit Tupperik Kanatami has ever had. We have uh, been an organization since 1971 and we have seen over the last four years a number of things that have been transformative that we have worked on for a very, very long time. So my counterparts, um, especially in the Assembly of First Nations, National Chief Perry Bellegarde and the Métis National Council President uh, Clément Chartier, we work on certain things together, uh, but largely we are in very different policy realms, in very different political realms, and serve very different structures. <laughs> 
So the Inuit Tepperite Kanatomy structure is uh, an expression of Inuit democracy. And this Inuit democracy sits alongside the Canadian democracy. Getting back to my original point about uh, Indigenous peoples have rights, and we respect those rights now in a um, ethereal way. When it comes to governance models, I think that uh, people are still skeptical or perhaps um, willing to be ignorant uh, of Indigenous models of governance. Uh, because they're just not like your own. They're not what you're used to. So uh, each one of our four regions have democratic elections for their leader, whether it's a chair and CEO or a president. Those four leaders who are elected democratically by the four regions of Inuit in Canada then make up the board of directors for uh, Inuit Tapirik Kanatomi. There are, are three permanent participants as well on our board of directors, the National Inuit Youth Council, the Inuit Circumpolar Council of Canada, which is an international Inuit body where there are four um, states with Inuit within them, and there's an international body that represents Inuit, um, I guess, across the, the Arctic, from Greenland, Canada, Alaska, and Russia. <clears throat> and then also uh, Pauktuti Inuit Women of Canada, which is uh, the women's specific organization. So I get my mandate, I get elected by the board of directors. I don't run on um, my own particular man uh, mandate or platform. So I wasn't out before my re-election saying I'm going to do these three or four things and this is how I'm going to do them. I'm I, I run on the ability to uh, uphold the collective interests of Inuit and the ability to educate Canadians, the ability to work with government, uh, the ability to provide specific support to the four Inuit regions through the organization. Those matter more within our national election than um, the specific ideals that I personally say that I'm going to fight for. And uh, it's interesting, even within our community, uh, people will say, well, not all Inuit can vote for the national president, so it's not democratic. And it's interesting that uh, we often don't stop and carefully consider our own democracies in this country, the ones that we just take for granted every day, and how few uh, provincial, territorial, national leaders get elected by the entirety of, of the population. So take the prime minister, for example. It, it isn't a vote for Justin Trudeau or Jagmeet Singh. It's a vote for the specific um, uh, member of parliament in your particular riding. How those leaders are, are um, appointed, elected, decided, I could question the democracy and all of that. Uh, do you have to be a member of the Liberal Party? Do you have to pay dues? Do you have to be in the room at the particular place in the particular time? Is that how I get to choose who then might become prime minister? Is that democratic? So we, don't, we, we just accept a lot of these things. Um, and the same thing goes with provincial or municipal politics, that they just exist and they're normal. And somehow indigenous politics is somehow abnormal and that you can poke holes in it every which way. Uh, uh, that is something that is, I found very common across Canada and also very common within the cabinet where cabinet ministers who uh, are, are supposed to be working with indigenous peoples are very comfortable in ridiculing certain democratic processes that indigenous peoples have created and that have been around for a lot longer than Canada has, has been around. So uh, that all comes back to the point that there is no melting pot for indigenous people in this country. There is no homogeneous indigenous person. There is no singular indigenous policy space. When I was listening to the debate uh, the other evening, the, the English debate, I was cringing throughout the indigenous uh, section of the debate. And I was really interested how quickly the leaders fell back into indigenous equals First Nations. 
and um, indigenous equals and uh, the, uh, sometimes the ability to cherry pick the issues that your party might be interested in rather than meet indigenous people with the priorities that they have for their communities. Uh, so I think we still have a long way to go in the way that Canada discusses First Nations, Inuit and Métis political issues and also the respect that Canada gives to the expression of indigenous governance, of First Nations, Inuit and Métis governance. I, I've been fortunate to, to be a part of um, the federal political landscape and the Inuit rights landscape now since about 2002. And I, I was very fortunate to be a part of the Kelowna process for Inuit and uh, be in Kelowna with Paul Martin and the Kelowna Accord, which lasted all of about three weeks. And, it, but it was the first time that I felt optimism for Canada as a country when it came to um, treating indigenous peoples uh, critically. That didn't get off the ground and in large part because it didn't have time, but also the federal public service at the time and still to this day is not structured to understand or to work within the complexity of indigenous rights and First Nations, Inuit and Métis interests. So even if uh, a liberal government had, um, had won and the implementation of Kelowna had happened, I, I don't think that Canada was ready at that point in time uh, for the innovations, especially as they affected the specific government departments. And I think it would have been a huge challenge for a government that was interested in implementing Kelowna to actually do it. And now here we are, um, here we were 10 years later uh, with a government that was pledging reconciliation. And uh, one of the things that, uh, one of the things that I remember the most was uh, again, being in the room and happy, uh, happy that I've played a small role in, in the, the way in which Inuit politics has, has interacted with the federal government over the last 15 years. But the prime minister asking, how are we going to do this? I, I don't know. And having First Nations, Inuit and Métis interests in the room and then saying, well, what if we created um, structure, bilateral structures and we met on shared priority areas, I, I created shared priority areas and then evaluated those shared priority areas over time and then linked those to federal budgets. And the immediate response, and the Prime Minister said, okay, and this was, a, this was in November of 2015. Uh, he just kind of nodded, and uh, it took a year, over a year, almost a year and a half, for the government to accept that these bilateral mechanisms were the, the, the way to actually make progress with Inuit. So in February 2017, Inuit leadership signed the Inuit Nunungat Declaration on the Inuit Crown Partnership. The Prime Minister signed it uh, along with myself and um, the Inuit leadership. And we worked for the last two years on creating shared priority areas, meeting three times a year, and then evaluating the success or failures of the shared work plan. Uh, this, is, this was a massive, uh, uh, win for Indigenous peoples in that we had never had a, a space where cabinet had sat down with our leadership and we had both had priority areas and we decided what we would do together. The challenge on implementing that in, this, uh, in a partisan uh, environment where ministers really rule all is that the uh, the initial um, reaction of all cabinet ministers and the prime minister and the prime minister's office is to control absolutely everything and to not share information and to dictate where the meetings take place, how long the me meetings are held, who chairs the meetings, um, who gets to be in the room, uh, what level of public service is going to be the technical lead. Uh, 
the exclusion or the inclusion of uh, political staff from ministers' offices. All of that system has worked in a, a partisan political environment, um, but it does not work with indigenous rights holders, with First Nations, Inuit, and Métis rights holders, because we have rights too, and we have governance models as well. We are not a public interest group. We, we're not the Sierra Club. We don't have to say yes to everything that the ministers or the prime minister want us to do. So a, a lot of the first uh, year or so was navigating through that and reorienting the public service, the ministerial staff, the ministers themselves, and the prime minister about the expectations and how to be a faithful partner. Uh, all the t conversation about reconciliation and what that might mean, uh, if it's aspirational and that's all it is, then it's useless. I, I just would rather not have it at all in our, our public discourse. What are you going to do? Like, How are you going to figure out how to change the relationship and reconcile? That is what we focused on, not the number of meetings we had or um, the amount of time that we got in front of a room uh, with a particular governing party. It was always about getting to results and getting to actions. And uh, there were some massive challenges along the way, but I'm very proud of the idea that we were able to move the thinking within the federal government that Inuit Nunangat is a distinct geographical, cultural, and political space, and that the federal government must recognize that in the way that it treats um, Inuit interests. We, at the, at the end of our um, run within this Inuit Crown Partnership Committee, we had uh, created even the schedule of meetings where they would align with um, best taking advantage of federal budget processes. So we would have a meeting in July to ensure that we would catch all the pre-budget submissions and we could use the fall then to, to ensure that the numbers added up when the, within the shared priority areas that then would be seen within federal budgets uh, in February and March. I know that this may seem uh, really <laughs> like getting to the, the insider trading type of, uh, of conversation on what, what happens uh, and, and how situational it might feel. But these are things that just hadn't been done before. And uh, I'm really proud to have been a part of this movement that has pushed Canada into a different place and hopefully for good. Uh, no matter what government is formed after this election, there is an expectation now from all Canadians that that government will work with Indigenous peoples on Indigenous rights and the implementation of Indigenous rights. Uh, whether or not that government uh, is going to honor that uh, is another story. But, at the same, but I am very pleased that we do live in a time of, of, of reconciliation. We also live in a time of climate change and of surging international interests, especially in, uh, business interests on our homeland and on the Northwest Passage. As early as 2036, there will most likely be ice-free summers uh, in the Canadian Arctic and that the multi-year sea ice will be replaced by, by uh, sea ice that uh, forms and, and thaws every single year. It's a massive shift in uh, our, our lives, has huge implications on our ability to hunt and, and live as Inuit within our society but it also on the, uh, the business front and on the international sovereignty front may have massive implications on uh, other state interests within the Arctic. We uh, worry about um, other nation states, especially China and the United States and Russia who uh, may question Canadian, in Canadian sovereignty or may just completely ignore it and uh, sail through uh, our, the, what we have decided, we have, we uh, assert as Canadian Arctic waters. Um, the challenge within this space 
is to recognize Inuit and Inuit sovereignty. Because if you think about Inuit Nunangat and you think about the in Aboriginal title, as it was called, that was exchanged for the rights and interests within our land claim agreements, they form the, the, the single most recognizable and solid foundation of Arctic sovereignty for Canada. But Canada has not included Inuit within these uh, international conversations about Canadian sovereignty in a way that is respectful of that particular reality. We don't want our homelands to be colonized for another time, uh, depending upon what interests we might have experienced in certain parts of, of our history. We've been colonized by the Hudson's Bay Company, different churches, um, whalers, uh, successive uh, governments and the federal government, the RCMP, whom, whomever. Each, we have 51 communities and each one has a different colonial legacy. But we are entering a time where there's um, a possibility that we will have another colonial movement within Inuit Nunangat. It isn't far-fetched and it could even happen by the Canadian government if the Canadian government does not include Inuit uh, and the assertion of Inuit sovereignty as a primary vehicle for Canada to express its sovereignty to the world. Uh, in the 1940s and 50s, especially in the World War II and post-World War II Cold War era, was the last time um, Canada spent uh, a huge amount of time focusing on sovereignty in real time with things that were in flux and actually happening. We've seen a threefold in increase in um, traffic across the Northwest Passage. And that's what I mean by real time changes in use of the Canadian Arctic. In the 1940s, prior to the US involvement in World War II, uh, it's negotiating with uh, with Great Britain linked into Canada and the use of the Canadian Arctic in its terms and conditions for joining World War II and supporting um, uh, the World War II efforts. A lot of the infrastructure then that exists across our 51 communities was built by the American military in the 1940s through the 1950s. In the Cold War era, uh, there were three levels at three different latitudes of distant early warning sites, radar sites to, that were um, meant to ensure that any aircraft or any weapons that were coming across from Russia were intercepted or were at least recognized um, in time for the US military to intervene. So at that point in time, we were being used as human flagpoles that they were Inuit that were moved thousands of kilometers to the north so that Canada could assert sovereignty. At the same time, Canada was giving orders in council to the U.S. military to build uh, military sites and airstrips and refueling sites across Inuit Nunangat. And Inuit were not a part of that at all. It's a part of Can Canadian history that perhaps not many Canadians know, and it was it was central to the war effort, and it, but it was completely passive in relation to Inuit involvement and recognition of our sovereignty. <clears throat> and I, I give you that history in saying that we could be entering a new age where uh, something akin to that happens again with the Canadian Arctic and especially with climate change and with the uncertainty of what will happen. The Arctic is warming at a rate of uh, 2.5 to four times uh, the global average. We already are seeing uh, a, a mean increase in temperature of 2.5 degrees over 1980 levels, not pre-industrial levels, but 1980 levels. We have seen seasonal temperatures that are up to five to five and a half degrees above uh, 1980 means. So we're seeing climate change happen in a drastic way, in a way that's affecting us and affecting our infrastructure and undermining the ability for us to travel and to uh, 
to utilize the lifestyle and the land that we've known forever. <clears throat> so climate change and the international influence uh, on the Canadian Arctic is one of these policy areas that I think is, is under, um, under discussed in a fulsome discussion because everyone knows that we're Northwest Passage and the ice is melting and those, those very central tenets of the conversation. Also that uh, Canadian sovereignty is a must. I mean, the, the, uh, the exercises that the Harper government did in the Canadian Ar Arctic Operation Nanook every year with the big splashy photo photographs of, you know, Harper on a, um, an icebreaker with jets flying overhead. That is a particular form of uh, response to sovereignty concerns. And we are just advocating for um, a more rightful based approach, especially in regards to, to Inuit rights. <clears throat> And I think that'll tie into the last part of um, what I want to, to share with you, and that's around the future of self-determination. Uh, what is in Canada's best interest? What is in Inuit's best interest? We have chosen Canada in many ways. Uh, it is, uh, we can say that we were colonized by this country, but we can also say that we now have modern land claim agreements. We have modern treaties with Canada. We have uh, indigenous rights as um, as peoples that are recognized in the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And then we also draw on other United Nations rights, especially uh, in relation to the rights of the child and basic human rights as peoples with an S. It's in Canada's strategic best interest to, to more fully implement Canadian Inuit rights, whether it's through sovereignty or whether it is just the country that Canada wants to be, the country Canada believes that it is. If we truly are in an era of reconciliation, then we, do, we need to reconsider the way in which Canada works on Indigenous um, policy. A party platform uh, of a ruling party that then translates into piecemeal legislation that perhaps um, provides a uh, moderate new investment within a policy area that requires a substantial radical reinvestment. This is the way in which public policy has shifted towards Indigenous peoples with uh, trickles here and there. For one, uh, for the one exception to that uh, has been the government of Canada's acceptance of uh, the public health crisis around tuberculosis and the pledge to end tuberculosis in Inuit Nunangat by 2030. That was the first time in Canada's history that the federal government has pledged to close a socioeconomic gap that existed within Inuit society to the Canadian average or higher. You think of any other uh, health gap. We have uh, three times the rate of infant mortality. We have 70% food insecurity of moderate to severe food insecurity. We have all of these different policy gaps, these, these quantifiable gaps and outcomes. This is the first time that Canada has had ever stated a level of ambition that met the level of ambition that it has for non-Indigenous Canadians more of those types of things need to happen, more, more acceptance of the responsibility of governments to, uh, to overcome the, uh, the Canada's colonial past, to put right uh, the relationship between Inuit and the Crown, but then also just to make this country into the best possible country that it can be. We have the means, we are a developed country, and yes, there are limitations in uh, funding for any policy area. And yes, Inuit have a growing number of assets and resources ourselves. So it isn't a request that Canada do things for Inuit, it is a request to do things together with Canada. <clears throat> 
that was at the heart of the Inuit Crown Partnership Committee, the heart of the shared priority setting, and then the heart of the implementation work. But these things only can um, be successful if the level of ambition is high enough and the consistency of how the government of Canada and provinces and territories work with Inuit remains true. One of the most high profile um, lapses in this was the creation of the Indigenous Languages legislation and the very clear um, rebuttal of that legislation from Inuit. Inuit were, we were told that we were going into a co-development process. We were told that anything was on the table. We have 65% of our population that still speak Inuktut as, a, as their first language. We have policy spaces such as Nunavut and Nunavik where you could easily provide um, language services to that population and federal services to that population. But we weren't able to um, create a piece of legislation and co-develop that legislation in a way that further implemented our existing language rights. And in many cases, I felt like it was a race to the bottom where the fear from the federal side was that if there was an any specific portion of that federal legislation, then somehow First Nations and Métis would want the same. I, I fail to see how that is a problem, but at the same time, we in this space are the majority. We uh, are an 85 to 90% majority across this entire space. We have a language that is protected uh, within various international mechanisms. And we don't have a country yet in Canada that is willing to step up and recognize and implement those rights. So that's one of those areas that we still need a lot of work on. And we, we can't uh, think about this in a fear-based, risk-based analysis anymore. Uh, sometimes there will be um, um, large amounts of money that are necessary to solve some of these challenges but I would argue that that is insignificant in relation to what we can all achieve together as a country. I really appreciate the opportunity to go through all of these different ideas and concepts and realities with you. And uh, now I'd like to welcome any questions you might have on ITK and um, on the work that we've done or anything relevant in relation to that. Um, I just wanted to ask, you've made mention about how Inuit democracy sits alongside Canadian democracy and about how at least in the beginning of dealing with this federal government there was some acknowledgement of that sort of bilateral consensus, um, but then that it kind of, within the meetings and the administration and the logi logistics of it, it became really clear that it was all on federal terms. I'm just wondering if there's been any sort of receptiveness by either the federal government or I guess any provincial governments either to having these kind of conversations within Inuit Nunagut on Inuit terms? Hmm. Our Inuit Crown Partnership Committee did meet in Inuit Nunagut uh, at least once a year. We had our initial meeting in Akaluit where the Prime Minister uh, signed the declaration. And uh, I would say that it was a seesaw throughout the entire last administration of respect for rights, but then also challenges in respecting rights. I, I think the, the largest challenge is the enormity of, of the issues and the insufficient level of capacity that the federal government has to understand and then uh, meet us in a respectful way whether it's the public service, whether it's the minister's offices, whether it's PMO, uh, there just has never been uh, the necessary dedicated capacity to actually understand how to do business with us. So we are always course correcting, we're always having to instruct or uh, educate uh, federal officials, ministers, um, uh, political advisors, so as to have a constructive conversation and that was consistent from the beginning to the end. And hopefully there will be a government at some point that doesn't require endless briefing uh, 
uh, introductory briefings, but uh, that's where we are right now. Thanks. Yeah. Also, just in relation to provinces and territories, it's not within provinces and territories' interest to uh, uh, facilitate the uh, the shifts that we are asking for, because provinces and territories were receiving funds without any um, explicit direction on how they had to engage with Inuit to spend those funds. And many times administrative um, uh, um, sums were kept within the particular province or territory instead of actually flowing directly to Inuit. So when you add up those different funds from different areas, uh, it, it represents in the eyes of some provinces and territories a loss of revenue and a loss of control. And provinces and territories um, don't like either of those things. Hi, my name is uh, Donald McCory. And uh, in 1966 and again in 1968, I was first a medical student and then a physician in, in uh, what was in Provish Bay. Um, I think you've made a, a long, long, great amount of progress from what I know of the Arctic at that stage. My point of view, of course, was always medical. I had no, not much to do with the, the people in the uh, political sense, but certainly from a social point of view, we had, I felt, much to contribute to the natives we saw at that time. The Frobisher Bay Hospital was about, or well, a hospital about 30 people. There were some well-trained nurses and some well-meaning doctors. I was only there during the summer, but certainly the rates of tuberculosis, as you mentioned, were very high. Interpreting, and interpreting with students mostly were high school girls. I recall vividly one patient asking about whether the patient had diarrhea or not. And the Eskimo, the, the Inuit interpreter spoke to the patient at some length, and then she turned to me and she said, what's diarrhea? <laughs> anyway, I, my congratulations on, on your presentation, and certainly I, I myself can see much progress has been made and much more to be done as well. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. I. Um there's so much to say, and especially in relation to health, we still face a, a number of challenges, and in Iqaluit, uh, formerly Frobisher Bay, uh, still does have a regional hospital. Uh, but the reality is, is that most of our 51 communities don't, do not have doctors still, and that they basically, uh, there are referral systems across Inuit Nunangat that go from small communities uh, with community health nurses who diagnose that somebody has something larger than a flu or a cough, that then they go to regional centers like Akaluit or Rankin Inlet or um, Kujak, and if there is anything larger than general medical care necessary, then they go to the south, to uh, Montreal, to uh, um, Ottawa, Winnipeg, Edmonton, Yellowknife. So we still have a model of referral systems and we have a lack of, of medical facilities in Inuit Nunangat, which would be akin to somebody getting service in Florida um, from Fredericton, uh, but having that service then delivered in um, Spanish. Uh, that's the reality that Inuit face in trying to get uh, access to uh, specific medical care in, across Inuit Nunangat. You spoke uh, a fair bit about um, language preservation in, in these areas. I'm wondering, uh, what is the, the state of the languages there? Uh, you, you mentioned that, was it about 65% of the people speak it as their first language? How much language variance is there across all of these different territories? And if there is a wide variety of language variance, uh, what difficulties in, does that create for language preservation? Great. Uh, I'm not a linguist, but I've become very versed in talking about language in my role because Inuit have uh, um, 
uh, this is a huge public policy issue. This is a huge priority for Inuit Tepere Kanatami. Across the Inuit Nunangat, uh, I'll just get the terminology uh, down. The term we use is Inuktut for all of the different dialects of our language. We share a common language across Greenland, Canada, Alaska, and Russia, but there are many different dialects of that language. There are lots of verbs and nouns and um, adjectives or other things, other uh, parts of the language that are the same, but then there are regional differences in dialects. So there are approximately 13 different dialects in Canada and nine different written orthographies. Across Inuit Nunangat, there has been um, a wide variance of uh, the ability to maintain our language. So in Nunatsiavut in Labrador, only about 10% of our population spill, still are fluent in Inuktitut, or Inuktitut, which is the local dialect. But then you go to Nunavik, and 99% of Inuit in Nunavik uh, uh, speak Inuktitut as their first language. In Nunavut, it varies from east to west. So in the Eastern Arctic and in the central part of the Arctic, or central part of Nunavut, um, Inuktitut is very strong. But then in the west, uh, Inuinaktun is again down to approximately 10 to 15%. Inuvialuktun in the Nuvialuit settlement area is again around 10%. So huge language um, utilization variance, large part due to government policies uh, across the different jurisdictions and the colonial histories. Say in, in uh, Northern Labrador, we were colonized first by the Moravian missionaries from Germany, the first written orthography in Canada came from the German missionaries. They were translating Bibles and hymnals uh, and, um, and then provided uh, uh, a base level of education to Inuit in Nunatsiavut in Inuktitut. Uh, but then in 1949, when Canada joined Federation, Confederation, when, I'm sorry, when Newfoundland and Labrador joined Confederation, Immediately, the Moravian influence over education and control over Inuit communities lessened, and there was an immediate drop-off in use of uh, Inuktu, Inuktu. And so you have this um, split between uh, language speakers for, who were alive and using Inuktu uh, prior to Confederation, and then Inuit who have um, have grown up with residential schools and basically a policy of exclusion for Inuktut uh, in, in education and in life. So each region is very different. We just released um, a common orthography, which we will use at the national level. It's the first time ever that Inuit have come together across Inuit Nunangat and created a common writing system that we, will, we pledge to use for all of our national publications which hopefully then will be another way in which we can preserve and promote our language and get more people speaking. Because it is our hope to revitalize our language and to have it be the primary language of our communities moving forward. Thank you. Hi, so I'm here with a group of first year law students. And as part of our constitutional law class, we actually discussed the um, re-Eskimos case that you were discussing. And in relation to that, we came to the topic of discussing um, Indigenous peoples being associated with um, professional sports teams. One, for example, being the Edmonton Eskimos. Um, and in particular, we actually watched an interview that you did um, where you discussed that topic. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you could um, expand on that a little bit and maybe let us know if there's any updates since that interview, which was a couple of years ago. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> getting right into the things that'll get me in the national news. Uh, <laughs> uh, first off, I just referenced Rieskimo in, um, in Montreal at the Inuit Studies Conference. I gave a speech there on Sunday, and I gave it in the perspective of Supreme Court rulings and the expertise that Supreme Court judges utilized in making that ruling and how important <laughs> it is for Inuit to have a, a self-determining place within research because uh, there's like one of the citations within the ruling 
states that um, Eskimos are the most untamable of all savages. And, so, and I was like, well, that's, is that a compliment? Or is it, it's like, <laughs> not sure. I don't think it was meant to be. Um, but the important part of that is that it wasn't that uh, a Supreme Court judge decided that, that was the case, that they actually were basing that ruling on that citation, that official record. Um, to show that we were savages and savages were us, uh, were Inuit or were Indians and how it existed within case law and and then the the, the last sentence of the ruling which was after uh, uh, after going through the records of cartographers and explorers and uh, uh, missionaries and government agents and um, uh, economic, ec well, business interests, we find that um, uh, that Eskimos are in fact Indians. It was important in that because it listed all the people that mattered, all the institutions in Inuit Nunangat that mattered and the Inuit were absent from any importance placed on the decision. So it just showed how important research is and how important it is that Inuit are self-determining and providing our own, um, I guess, land use and occupancy, like their, our own uh, reality about who we are in our homeland. In relation to indigenous mascots and monikers, I think it's really, uh, like this is something that I'm passionate about. This is, I went to high school in Old Town, Maine, and our mascot was the Indians. And we actually played on the reservation. Of the, um, and the, it was the stereotypical Indian headdress um, on the chest. And there was the um, Chief Wahoo style, big nosed um, uh, Native American caricature on the sleeves. And the tomahawk chop and the, um, the war whoops and everything. That was what I had to subject myself to, to play hockey, like my passion. And uh, that always stuck with me as something that was just categorically unfair and racist. It used to be that in North America, uh, entertainment in many ways revolved around uh, mocking um, ethnic minorities, stereotypes. You can go back into any uh, a comedy, uh, any movies, and you see just this this um, embracement of of the stereotypes of ethnic minorities as entertainment. So what we have now is a remnant, an echo of that practice that still exists, but only now within sports, and only within indigenous peoples. So the fact that Entertainment, uh, sports, uh, many of the offending parties here are sports entertainment franchises. They are willfully um, perpetuating stereotypes against indigenous peoples and um, perpetuating racist actions. Um, you go back, uh, I challenge you all to just go back through and look at any of these institutions, Kansas City Chiefs, Atlanta Braves, uh, Cleveland Indians, uh, Edmonton Eskimos, look at their programs throughout the years. Look at what was on the cover of them. A lot of this is the perpetuation of racism through suggestion. What do, if you're an opposing team, what are you gonna do? You're going to make fun of their mascot. You're gonna try to belittle them through any means you can. So uh, I think that this is a, um, an issue that that will not um, persevere over time and is something that people will look back on in North American society and say, oh my God, I can't believe that in 2019 that was happening. Just like we can look back 100 years and think there was segregation, there was Jim Crow, there was, in North America, there's all sorts of awful things that have happened in regards to um, indigenous peoples, in ethnic minorities all sorts of racism. This is one of those echoes. This is one of those things that has been normalized and uh, nothing has happened in relation to the Edmonton team. But I am hopeful 
I always thought that it would not be just one year or wouldn't just be me saying one thing. Like, I am not a mascot. I'm not a moniker. And if I am your mascot, I'm telling you I don't want to be your mascot. So how clear is that? Like, and if you say, well, uh, as a team, you're like, actually, we're just going to go out and canvas that. We'll, we'll find some other people who are fine with it. You don't do that with other things. Nobody did any sort of canvassing on whether or not Justin Trudeau's blackface was acceptable or not. There wasn't this movement that basically said, we'll normalize this, this was OK. And the people who were offended by it, you shouldn't have been. And we're actually honor uh, Trudeau was honoring you. And if anybody does use that line of questioning, they are mocked mercilessly. Somehow that doesn't hold with indigenous mascots. And somehow we do the same things over and over with straw polls about whether or not things are racist. Or we just are collectively OK with seeing the term Eskimos across sports pages across this country all the time, or Indians, or Redskins. When is our media going to actually live reconciliation? When are we going to say, this is not OK? And it's not that the people who went to those games and cheered for those teams are racist. That's not what we're saying. We're saying society changed, and that we are going to respect people. We're going to respect indigenous peoples in a way that we now know we can. We perhaps society didn't understand what it was doing in the past, but we understand today. So I do hope uh, that there is a sea change. And the human rights movement, I think, is going to play a very meaningful role in that. And litigating uh, these, these teams, especially in specific jurisdictions, just like uh, what has happened to the Cleveland Indians in relation to the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal, if, if people aren't going to be respectful, there are now other mechanisms that I do hope that are used to ensure that this does not uh, continue to be a reality that we all have to live with. I appreciate you, you talking about the environmental uh, challenges that your community, communities, sorry, are facing. And I'm wondering if you could tell us uh, maybe in more detail, like what specific challenges uh, you, you, th you feel that you'll be facing. I know in some parts of the world, we're looking at uh, rising sea levels, making it impossible to live there. I mean, are there concerns within your community that they'll be made into refugees at some point in, in the near future, you know what I mean? Uh, and on the other side of that, I'm, I'm here with an education department, and I, I would be grateful to hear you speak uh, somewhat about the, the challenges maybe that the, your community is uh, dealing with on, on the education front. Okay. Thank you. In relation to climate, uh, okay, if you think about that entire space, and how for seven or eight months of the year, seven or nine months of the year, uh, that entire space is covered by sea ice. Also think that there's only uh, two communities out of 51 that are connected to the South by roads. So 49 of those 51 communities uh, uh, are fly-in, fly-out communities. But traditionally, in the summer, we had um, used kayaks or umiaks to, to go between one community and another, but it was easier and most effective to use sea ice, and that's those are our roads. We have established road networks across that entire space, and we have our knowledge uh, that uh, in which then, when, then we make decisions about when it is safe to travel, where it is safe to travel. Uh, climate change has undermined a lot of that knowledge, so our very road network is, has been um, transformed into uh, huge risks in relation to us going between communities, but also then harvesting and hunting. So um, uh, there have been some uh, very sad tragedies of hunters falling through the ice and, and losing their lives on routes that they had been traveling for decades. We're not talking about random people wandering around in risky conditions. We were talking about Inuit who grew, have grown up and have the most intimate knowledge of um, the sea ice in our environment as anyone in the world. So that's a challenge. We also are seeing um, shifts in species and species distributions. We're seeing influxes of, of um, 
predators like killer whales. We are also seeing uh, in certain parts of the Arctic, grizzly bears encroaching upon uh, certain territories. In our uh, community of Nain, we'd never seen moose uh, growing up, but now, now there are moose. So species distribution is changing very rapidly. Also, the health of our caribou. Uh, we don't have a definitive answer of why many of our caribou herds have crashed, but uh, climate change is suspected to be one of the largest reasons. The George River herd, which is was the largest herd in the world uh, of almost a million uh, animals, had dwindled to the point where there's 6,000, and this happened in nine years. So the po these population crashes have been extreme. And uh, you take out a central food source, you're, you have more food insecurity, but then if you take out that food source for a long period of time, you are also losing um, the, the rich complexity of knowledge the Inuit have about the environment and about the species within it. Because conservation isn't a term that we've really been able to uh, uh, to morph with the way in which we see the world. Even when there are only 10 to 15,000 uh, caribou, we know through our elders that there always have been cycles. And so even at the downturns of cycles, one or two animals might be harvested, if only just to preserve that knowledge and preserve the understanding from generation to generation. The difference in sexes, the difference in ages, um, the, um, the most respectful way to, to harvest, how to cut up an animal, how to share it. This knowledge is central to our identity and to our society. And losing some of that and the, the fear of losing more of it through, um, through a changing Arctic and um, the disappearance of certain key species in the Arctic is something that we really worry about. Uh, ongoing acidification, the loss of sea ice year over year, all of these things uh, have tremendous impacts on how we harvest, where we go, and the health of, of the animals that we live with and, uh, and depend upon for our well-being. So it is a drastically changing world, and uh, people are in many ways quite uh, like very concerned at the deep core of our being about what is to come. In relation to education, we, we created a, a National Inuit Education Strategy in 2011, and we are in the midst of doing things like um, creating an Inuit Nunangat University and taking all steps necessary to do that. Uh, we also are trying to ensure that parental involvement is uh, increased trying to ensure that there are more Inuktut-specific resources and Inuit-specific resources in all of our classrooms from K to 12. We're uh, doing all that we can within post-secondary, and we've uh, um, doubled the, we've lobbied for and then received double the amount of post-secondary support from the federal government for Inuit students. So we're trying to do a whole host of things together, but it also comes down to uh, the ability for students to come to school well-rested and ready to learn. And so some of that comes back to housing and overcrowding and food insecurity. So we also know that stability and the, um, the well-being of our children in our communities is a primary foundational stepping stone to better education. I would like to know right now in, I'll use the example of Nunavut, the territorial government is bringing into uh, play, and I apologize, English is my second language, uh, bringing into play an amendment to the Inuktitut Protection Language Act. It pushes away the requirements for schools to teach in Inuktitut to Inuit children as well as non-Inuit children. So my question is, what influence does Inuit Tapari Kanatami have on the public territorial governments within Inuit Nunangat when policy changes come into play that directly affect Inuit culturally relevant issues such as Inuktut language? Mm. Uh, because we are a national in structure, we deal primarily with national interests that are common to all regions. So in regards to the government of Nunavut, uh, 
Nunavut Tungavik and the regional Inuit associations within Nunavut play that primary role of advocate for things specific uh, within the government of Nunavut and within the legislative structures. Sometimes Nunavut Tungavik will bring specific concerns to the ITK board and the ITK board will then um, make resolution to support. So for things like um, when there was a hydroelectric dam in uh, Muskrat Falls just outside of the Labrador Inuit settlement area that would put at risk uh, the marine environment within the, uh, the Nunatsivut settlement area, the Nunatsivut government came to the table and asked the other regions to support a letter from all um, presidents from ITK to the, the minister responsible in, um, in federally. So there are scenarios where ITK supports regional uh, challenges, but for the most part, uh, the regions each do those things independently of ITK, and we uh, do as directed by our regional land claim organizations. I'm wondering if um, ITK has, and with the Youth Council, has exchange programs with students high school students, university students, and I, I ask this question because back in the 1980s, I was a high school teacher in Montreal and I took three groups of high school students to Inuktuak in three different years. And they, we stayed for maybe two weeks in, in, the, in the town. And when my students returned <clears throat> to Montreal, they were completely hostile to our own culture. They had just integrated so much into the collective um, aspect of the Inuit culture. And they commented so many times about why they felt so poor and the Inuit community was so rich in um, a feeling of community and sharing. It just blew their minds. It's over like, five or six weeks they would be in my classroom or in, even in my house just dumping on our horrible capitalist, selfish, <laughs> greedy, it's a terrible culture that we live in. And it probably took them, you know, two months or so to reintegrate. But, but what I'm saying is that, well, these kids would be in their 60s now, but you've got somewhere out in Canada at least 30, 40 kids that I know of who were just really passionate about the Inuit culture and would have always spoken highly of it and of their experience in that community. So are we still doing that? And shouldn't we be if we're not? Uh, ITK or the National Inuit Youth Council do not have programs specific to uh, cultural exchanges, although there are a number of organizations that I can think of off the top of my head that uh, Inuit have participated in. Canada Roots Exchange is a program that got federal funding uh, uh, to expand its programs, but it has had um, reconciliation-focused exchanges between Inuit, First Nations, Métis, and Southern Canadians. And my good friend, Max Feinde, is the executive director. He'll be very glad that I mentioned him tonight. Uh, <laughs> Northern Youth Abroad is also something that uh, has grown over time. It was started as something called Nunavut Youth Abroad, but now it uh, is encompassing more of the territories. It was more, mostly a, an international exchange program, but I know many young Inuit have, have taken part in that, and many international students uh, have, um, have come to Inuit Nunangat. Also, Students on Ice uh, is... Uh, is now becoming more and more of a leader in, in those cultural exchange programs. And every year there are quote unquote expeditions. I wish you would change that name. But there are, there are trips to the Canadian Arctic and to Greenland uh, where up to, I believe it's 300, 400 um, students and perhaps I believe 30 to 40% of them are indigenous get to um, uh, see what it's like firsthand in Greenland and in Canada. And then also, just on the post-secondary level, the Jane Glasgow Fellowship uh, is a program for Northerners, but it's not only a good 
thing to have southern non-indigenous uh, um, young people who can come to the Canadian Arctic. It's also really good for us to be able to work amongst our peers across um, the north or across Inuit Nunagat, and so the Jane Glasgow Fellowship does that for um, for northerners. So there are a few examples, but I'm sure that there could be a lot more. I think that there was a, um, an opportunity missed within the government and the Katimovic funding uh, um, that could have been more explicitly focused on Indigenous and Inuit uh, in the way in which it rolled out uh, because there was a healthy amount of funds that were allocated towards something similar to this. We did, we did have Inuit students visit us in St. Lambert from Inuchuak, and we have very interesting experiences because n nobody knew anything about each other's culture. So these young people from Inuchuak who had never seen a tree would just go in people's yards and climb the trees, and you know the police were caught. It was just like, <laughs> oh please! But I, we've come such a long way, and I think it's just wonderful to have you here and listen to the real story. Thank you. Yeah. I can remember when my son, my eldest son, was two and we came down to Ottawa and it was the first time he could actually, uh, the first time we were in the south and he could talk and he just looked out the window at, at the, the trees and he was like, can you eat them? Because <laughs> he had, I think, equated it with broccoli. So I, th I always thought that that was really cute. Hi, um, oh, excuse me. I've applied to an opportunity to live in Aglulik, and I'm just wondering how I can have a positive impact on the community up there. I appreciate the question. and uh, I think first and foremost it is having the respect of the community is largely dependent upon your ability to listen and also to uh, take positive spaces where you can show that you're an ally, you can uh, help uh, in the areas that you are bringing, because we do need lots of people who uh, aren't Inuit to, to work in our communities or to m help bridge that capacity uh, void moving forward. But how that happens has been the, the biggest reason why there has been animosity towards non-Inuit who come into Inuit Nunangat to work whether it's uh, the griping about the cold or uh, like the uh, um, like teaching people how to game the system and doing it. Like there are, you'll see, uh, um, <laughs> but I think it's just not falling into those traps of thinking of yourself as an outsider and also then having your own um, bubble of, of peers that will most undoubtedly seek you out and want to bring you into a society within a society. Uh, be respectful of the community and be a part of the community. And that sometimes means just listening, learning. Um, it also sometimes means tasting some food that you might not think that you might like. And, uh, and I also it is think it's just meeting people where they are and learning how to p say people's names. So uh, thank you, we'll, we'll bring this uh this lecture to a close. Um, I want to express our gratitude one more time uh, on behalf of the students, faculty, and administration at St. Thomas, on behalf of the uh, University of New Brunswick Law School students, and Professor Nicole O'Byrne. Uh, uh, thank you so much for visiting and for your passion in this discussion this evening. So thank you so much to President Natan Obed for his time and insight.